Hello, everyone. Yeah. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome all to my Ray talk. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, Merlin, which is Shopify's new machine learning platform. And this image is from a blog post we published earlier this year about this topic exactly. Uh, you can find it and read more about it at the Shopify engineering blog. So uh, I'm Isaac Vidas. Uh, I'm a machine learning platform tech lead uh, at the ML platform team at Shopify. I joined Shopify in March 2021. Uh, I love distributed systems, ML ops, and emojis. And I'm also happy to connect with anyone on LinkedIn. Uh, so a little bit about uh, Shopify in one sentence. Shopify is an all-in-one commerce platform that enables merchants to set up online shops easily and makes commerce better for everyone. Now that we know more about Shopify and me, let's talk about machine learning at Shopify. So at Shopify, we have hundreds of data scientists that do machine learning uh, use cases uh, every day. There are tens of teams doing ML uh, in, in different, uh, with, with different requirements uh, for machine learning use cases. And many data scientists at Shopify are already using Merlin on their day-to-day -day, uh, job. A migration to our new platform is ongoing, but we already have uh, more than 40 use cases running on the new platform, and it still keeps happening as time moves on. In the, ML, in the ML platform, uh, we have set up the goals to enable Shopify's teams to train, test, deploy, serve, and monitor machine learning models efficiently and quickly. So basically, the whole ML workflow end-to-end -end on a, one platform. With Merlin, we enable scalability with robust infrastructure that can scale up our machine learning workflows. We also enable fast iterations with tools that reduce friction and increase productivity for our data scientists and machine learning engineers by minimizing the gap between prototyping and production. And we also have flexibility so that our users can use any libraries or packages that they need for their use cases and their models. Let's talk and dive more deeply into Merlin and how it was built and being used at Shopify. As a background, the ML platform went through two iterations in the past. The first one was built on top of an in-house PySpark system solution. And the second iteration was built as a wrapper around the Google AI platform, which is these days called Vertex AI. And it runs as a managed service on GCP. Last year, we reevaluated our machine learning platform based on different requirements that we got from our users and data scientists, and also based on the goals that we just talked about. And so we decided to rebuild our machine learning platform on top of open source tools and technologies around the goals that we discussed, such as scalability, fast iterations, and flexibility. Just a couple of words about the timeline. We made the decision to rebuild our machine learning platform in March 2021, last year. Then we went into uh, a prototyping phase and POC around different open source tools that we wanted to test out. In August, we started building our production environment. And then earlier this year in February, we released Merlin as a to general availability for all of our data scientists and machine learning engineers. This is a diagram of a very, very early version uh, of Merlin. Uh, two things about this. Uh, we clearly did not have graphic designers at the time. And the other one is we did not have a clear vision of how the ML platform would look like after the prototype. And so we understood, obviously, that there's the machine learning workflow. And we start uh, in the beginning from the input from our data lake or uh, streaming events. We go through computation, pre-processing, training, evaluation, 
and then serving the model uh, for either batch use cases or online inference. We did know that on the infrastructure level, we will run on top of Kubernetes. And then on the application layer, we will leverage Ray for distributed computation. So why um, are Shopify and myself are very, very excited about Ray? Uh, first thing first, it's an open source library. So it ties very much into our plans for the machine learning platform. Also, Python is a first class citizen, which means that our data scientists that use Python every day can onboard very quickly to Ray and to this new platform. We can also use Ray for any kind of distributed jobs uh, with many libraries and applications and tools that are dedicated for ML. In addition, you can also run different distributed processing libraries on top of Ray, such as Dask, Spark, or Modin. They even have a new integration that they're working on for Beam, which we heard a talk about this yesterday from Patrick. And this just shows the flexibility and size of this ecosystem. When thinking about how we can build a machine learning platform and how we can integrate it with Ray, there are different ways to do it. On one hand, you can have a single Ray cluster where you can run all of your machine learning jobs and workflows on top of. On the other hand, you can have a Ray cluster that is dedicated for each use case individually. When looking into Ray and prototyping it with it, we, we quickly understood that the driver, the Ray driver and workers must have the same Ray version and Python version, which means that for us, we made a decision on having ephemeral Ray clusters, which means that each Ray cluster is created when the job starts and deleted when the job ends. And each Ray cluster is isolated for a specific machine learning use case. When you build your own platform, you can choose the right option for you. This is just what works well for us. And then when thinking about the dedicated and ephemeral Ray cluster that we're using, we coined the term Merlin workspace that basically wraps this around. Um, and then each use case can have a dedicated Merlin workspace that can be used for the distributed computation that happens in that Ray cluster. And that Merlin workspace can contain both the resources requirements on the infrastructure layer, and then the dependencies and packages that are required for the use case on the application layer. In these few examples, we have like four different use cases. One of them, uh, a few of them can use GPUs, for example, on the infrastructure. And then on the application layer, each one has a Ray cluster uh, with the different libraries that are needed for that use case specifically, which can be TensorFlow, PyTorch, et cetera. What is important here is that workspaces is, are the most important part of the platform where computation is being done, which can be either pre-processing, training, inference, or any other computation that can happen on one node or in a distributed fashion. This is an example of how we use a dedicated Merlin workspace for training for our product categorization use case, which uses Ray Train and TensorFlow. And so on the infrastructure layer, we're using GPUs, CPUs, pods, Kubernetes. We also leverage auto scaling so we can scale up to the amount of resources that we need. And then on the application level, we have a Ray cluster that we run Ray Train and TensorFlow on. And this code is basically just an example of the training script that runs on that, Ray, on, on that Merlin workspace and Ray cluster behind the scenes. In a different step of the machine learning workflow, we perform inference for product categorization. And in this situation, and in, on that step, we no longer need GPUs. However, we do leverage a different part of Ray, which is the Ray actor pools. And it allows us to have uh, to send different partitions through the model that we just trained in order to return inference. And that, in our sp specific case here, we're using actor pools, but this could have been also using Dusk or using Ray datasets, etc. 
if we take a step back, let's look at the Merlin architecture as we build it. And so everything we talked about uh, until now is the Merlin core. In the Merlin core, we have the Kubernetes layer, and then on top of it, the auto-scaling, and individual Merlin workspaces where each one has a Ray cluster and the different machine learning steps that are running on each Ray cluster individually. Each Merlin workspace has a direct access to our data lake in order to load data sets from or save models into, and also access to our panel feature store. In addition, we also created a Merlin API. This API helps us to perform management of the different Merlin workspaces that we create on this uh, Merlin and Kubernetes environment. This API is a unified API where it doesn't matter if you're in like the production orchestrator that runs Airflow or, or through Uzi, or a user running their job and prototyping from a Jupyter notebook, they're all going to be using this API in order to create the different Merlin workspaces and leverage them for distributed machine learning workflows. If we look uh, a, a little bit closer into the Merlin API, it's basically a REST API that allows our users to create, update, and delete uh, Merlin workspaces and behind the scenes Ray clusters. In this example, our users can define different parameters that they need for their machine learning workflow. For example, the name of the, of the Merlin workspace, the owner so we can keep track of it, the base image that the Merlin workspace and Ray cluster will run with, the min max workers for scalability, and the amount of CPUs, memories. They can, they can also specify the GPU type and number of GPUs that they want to use. And uh, for example, they can enable Jupyter Lab to run on the head node so they can have direct access into the Ray cluster immediately. Behind the scenes, this is mostly a wrapper around kubectl. What happens is those parameters are being taken and then in, injected into a manifest of a Kubernetes manifest YAML file. And with the Python API, we basically apply it on the Kubernetes clusters. Um, one thing that it helps us with is it completely abstracts all of the infrastructure uh, elements and complications from our users. So they don't even have to think about Kubernetes when they work with Merlin. What all they have to do is work through this API or the CLIs that we create for them, and that's it. In addition, it helps us because it reduces the amount of permissions that we have to take care of, right? So even if we want to migrate them between clusters or change the infrastructure underneath the platform, we can do it very easily without affecting or impacting our users. In addition, this API is also versioned. So any new changes that we incorporate cannot break uh, clients that are using uh, the previous version. Once our users are creating a new Merlin workspace, they get back a full payload with the details for that work, workspace. That workspace can include different URLs that will help our users to manage and access the new Ray cluster with a dashboard or the Ray head node address or Ray job submit address so they can send jobs uh, to, to run on the cluster, access to the Jupyter notebooks, and also observability for their dedicated environment with Splunk URLs and Datadog dashboards. In addition, each Merlin workspace gets its own time to live, right? This means that at the end of that time frame, the cluster will, be, will die. There's a, there are jobs that run periodically and make sure that expired workspaces will be deleted. This means that no one will forget a lot of GPUs running in the background and go out to the weekend. And this also allows us to kind of put in tripwires. So we know of large jobs that are starting to run and we can make sure that we, that we plan ahead for them if we need more resources in the future. In addition, we also included recently cost estimation in the image you see that at the bottom. Uh, this means that the user is very, very familiar with the amount of money it takes to run their jobs. And we can also have an estimation for the max age cost 
because we know how much time the workspace will run for with the time to leave. Once the workspace is up and running, our users can start prototyping in a distributed environment. They have two options for them. Either use Jupyter Notebooks from a central Jupyter Hub, or they can work from their local machines and use different Ray client or connections or APIs to send their jobs into the remote Ray cluster. From the Jupyter Notebooks, they can easily use gRPC with the Ray client API to run different uh, jobs. And from their laptop, they can also use the Ray client or Ray job submit, which will help them to package the code that they just written on their local environment and then send it to the remote Ray cluster. Just, this just allows fast iterations for our users, which is one of our goals for the platform. From our orchestrators, there are, again, different ways to schedule and run jobs on the remote Ray clusters. From Airflow, we can spin up a pod, which will run the Ray driver code, and that will work remotely with the Ray cluster through the Ray client to gRPC API. From a legacy PySpark system that we have in place, we can leverage the Ray job submit to send the, uh, the Ray jobs that will, run on the Ray, like, that will run the Ray driver on the Ray head node. And from the PySpark system, we can just wait for the job to end and also tail the logs. This just shows the many different ways that we can use Ray to run remote jobs easily, no matter what the limitations are or the constraints. Um, the Ray job submit specifically was really, really helpful with using legacy systems and connecting them to the new platform that we're building. If we'll take a step back and look specifically on the infrastructure layer. So um, when a user creates a new Merlin workspace, we begin by creating a new Kubernetes namespace in our Kubernetes uh, clusters. We start by running the Ray namespace operator which helps to create the Ray clusters and also auto-scale them. The next part will be that the Ray head node will go up, and then the workers, based on the requirements from our users, and if needed, it can auto-scale accordingly. We create two ingresses, one for HTTP access to our Ray cluster and another one for the gRPC access to it. The Ray head node and the Ray workers are all running based on an image that we create specifically for each individual use case. What happens from the user perspective is that they write their code and they push it to the repo. Once the code is in the repo, in a branch or in the main branch, automated CICD pipelines take that specific code and requirements and build a Merlin project image that is dedicated for a specific machine learning use case. And that image is then being pushed into the Google Cloud Registry, GCR. And when the Ray head node and worker starts, they pull that image, and the Ray cluster that you get includes all the code that is dedicated for that machine learning use case. From the user's perspective, again, they work with a monorepo that we set up for them. They have, uh, that monorepo has a projects folder, and under, it, under this folder, each project, each Merlin project get, gets its own folder. That folder will contain the source code for the use case, the unit tests, and also a configuration for it. The configuration sits inside of the config.yml file that you see here in the image. And once the user pushes this code to a branch or merges that branch into the main, uh, the main branch, automated CICD pipelines will take all of those artifacts and create a Docker image for that so they can use that for creating their Merlin workspace. If we take a look at the config.yml file that uh, in, is included with each Merlin project, we can see different elements that uh, our users need to put in. For example, the code owners for the use case, so we'll know who is owning this thing. 
uh, in addition, the base image that we're building the Merlin project on top of. System packages on the operating system level and a Conda environment with the Python dependencies that are needed for this use case. In this example, our use case is called the Boston Housing Scikit-Learn. It uses Python version 3.8.12 with uh, a Ray version 1.12.1, which will be upgraded to 2.0 uh, very soon, uh, and then uses Pandas, NumPy, and Scikit-Learn for the code that we're running. This just shows the flexibility that we allow our users to have because each project can use a different set of requirements and a different set of images and dependencies based on what they need for their use case. We also added a CLI for our platform. That CLI allows our users to create and manage their Merlin projects, also create and manage their Merlin workspaces through that API that we built, run remote Ray jobs, so again, on their laptop, they can use this CLI to wrap all, all the artifacts that they have on their laptop and then send it to the remote Ray cluster for fast iterations. And it also allows them to create a local dev environment. In this image, we see the command that creates a new Merlin project, which will send the users through a wizard of, use cha of, of choosing the dependencies that they need. And you know, it will take them through it or give them the ability to have a completely custom Merlin project that they can specify for themselves. And this thing is easily extendable as we add more and more features to our platform. On the orchestration side, we have uh, different orchestrators. This is an example of an Airflow DAG where we created um, different Airflow operators for starting and deleting Merlin workspaces so that our users don't have to think about it. And all they need to do is to create a DAG for their use case specifically. In this very, very simple example, we have just one step, which is the training. And it always starts with creating the workspace, going through the ML workflow, and then deleting the workspace at the end. Let's take a step back and look at the user workflow end to end. So we start with a new machine learning project uh, by creating a new Merlin project. Then we go into prototype phase where our users can create Merlin workspaces and prototype on it from their local machine or a Jupyter notebook. Once their code is ready, they can push it into the Merlin project repo and uh, update it with everything that they need and then go into the orchestrators so they can uh, periodically uh, schedule their jobs to run every now and then. Once they need to update their project, they go back to the prototype phase and iterate on everything that they built. Summary. What did we learn? Uh, we learned a lot from building Merlin and our previous iterations, and just mentioning a few of the main lessons that we learned. When building a machine learning platform, it's important to build around real use cases in order to make sure that real user requirements are being addressed. In our case, when we did the POC, we chose one of the most complicated use cases that we have at Shopify with the most amount of data that we have to scale up to. This allows us to say, hey, you know what? Ray is actually very, very good for scaling up. And it actually you know, held the, the amount of data that we had to use for training and processing. In addition, building a platform is completely different than maintaining one. Like we've been building one for the past year and a half. We are slowly transitioning into a maintaining one, into a maintaining a, a machine learning platform. And this means that making changes is a little bit more difficult and a little bit like it requires a little bit more frictions because we don't want to have downtimes and we're very careful of hurting the production jobs that are already running on top of it. In addition, Ray is a really great library, right? Like it changes frequently and also adds a lot of features all the time. But this also means that we need to plan ahead and make sure that we can include these new features as the library changes. Building is difficult, maintaining is difficult, and also migrating users to a new platform in the third time that you do it is also extremely difficult. 
all the goals that we set up allowed us to migrate our users much easily than before because now they actually want to migrate to the new system because they can do whatever they want with it, right? They can use whatever library or package that they want to for their use case, and it just helps them to move more quickly and use the right tool for the job. And the user experience. While building a machine learning platform, it's also important to remember who your users are and their profile. And if it requires, add CLI or different tools to allow them to, to migrate to your new platform easily. So what did we cover? We talked about Ray. Uh, we talked about how we built a machine learning platform on top of Ray, how we isolate distributed computation environment, and the lessons learned that we have from building a machine learning platform for the third time. But no, the journey is not over. We also have still, like, we still have gaps that we need to make sure that we complete for our machine learning platform. We recently added the ability to deploy and serve machine learning models for online inference and real-time predictions. We also added a low-code framework for machine learning pipelines so our users can focus only on the models and what they need to build. In the future, we plan to upgrade to Ray 2.0 and CubeRay, add a model registry for experiment tracking, and have a standard for monitoring machine learning models in production. Before we go into questions, I just wanted to extend many acknowledgments and thanks for, and a huge, huge shout out for the ML platform team that worked a lot on this in the past year and a half. Uh, we have here in the, in the crowd uh, Alex, Kay, and Vivian. Uh, so also feel free to say hello to them. Uh, everyone at Shopify that helped us to uh, build this thing from the data science teams that onboarded to the platform, the product managers, DevOps team that helped us with the infrastructure, and the user experience test group that helped us to validate everything that we built so far. And a special thank you for everyone at the Anyscale team that helped us and still support us uh, to build this amazing new platform. And thank you all for joining this talk. <laughs> Questions? We only have like two and a half minutes. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Um, I'm curious how serving, online serving, interacts with the workspace concept, uh, particularly um, seems like having a, a predefined TTL makes it difficult to have long-lived yep. deployments. I'm yep. interested how you resolve that. OK. So in online inference, we separate the workspace uh, and a service, right? Service is a okay. long-term running thing which we can have a whole talk about that and how we did it at Shopify. Um, but the workspace is actually being used to test out the API and the serving layer before you deploy to production, right? So this is kind of like, it can be as a small dev environment that you can use for the online predictions before you deploy it as a service. So is my, it, would my workspace be the same environment as like one or more services that are sort of associated with it, or are the concepts totally separate? You can, you can set it up this way. Um, obviously, for services, you might need reduced resources because you're not running like training or something like that. But you can set up a Merlin workspace with like two CPUs and uh, five gig of memory or something like that if you want really something slim. Um, but yeah, you, you, yeah th that's basically the, the ability that that you can set up from the platform. But you can also go the path of like, hey, I'll de just deploy it as a service and, check and test that in the staging environment. Great, thank you. Yep. Hi, thank you for the great talk. A quick question. Can you share how the cost estimation feature is done? Yes, uh, so um, when we create, so from the API, it's very easy to start labeling the resources that we create on Kubernetes, right? And then on GCP, you can set up like different queries and different dashboards that you can, you know, then take into account as, as you know, even live, right, for the specific resources that you're using. Uh, some of it is like hand wavy, right? But uh, like we, we can give some sort of estimation. 
It's not precise, but it's close enough. Hey, Isaac, great talk. Thank you. Uh, question on the workspace. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how you do versioning of those workspaces? OK, and yeah. How data scientists collaborate on the workspaces? Yeah, so good question. Um, so the versioning is not on the workspace layer level. It's on the API, right? So uh, like the API is basically a fast API that we, you know, we, we create different versions. And then if we add a breaking change, we can set up it as a new version, right? So, our, so we don't have to update all of our clients uh, at the same time. For uh, using the same workspace across different teams or across different individuals, so each workspace gets its own DNS uh, record. And also, if they include the ability to run Jupyter Lab on top of the head node, everyone can just access that uh, Jupyter Lab and collaborate. Uh, we tried to integrate in the past the real-time collaboration with Jupyter Lab, but it's still kind of flaky. And we'll wait until Jupyter uh, 4.0 to include that. OK, that's all the time we have for questions. Please give a round of applause to Isaac, our speaker. <laughs> <laughs>